All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I'm joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. Good. Today's podcast is a little Q&A session. Brent's got some questions that came through. We've been gone for a few weeks, out bear hunting, and so a lot bear of questions. Bear slaying, you mean. <laughs> a lot of uh, questions came through in the interwebs, and we're going to get some of these questions answered mm-hmm. today. I went through, snagged a bunch of comments and stuff off YouTube, and we're just going to try and see how many of these we can crush out. And I have not seen them, so we'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. All right. First question. Paradise Valley Outdoors. Brian, what gun, caliber, and scope are you running for bears? We leave from Wisconsin for DIY Idaho hunt May 26th. Love, love, love your gear dumps. Help me be more prepared. Okay. Uh, Ryan and I have both been running this 6.5 RPM, the Weatherby 6.5 RPM Titanium the TI uh, with Weatherby that gun we've been using two years in a row Mm -hmm. It's our second kind of year using it. And we are smoking bears and smoking deer with it. Um, It's, we were just talking about this the other day. It really does. It it is an ideal round Mm -hmm. and, and an ideal like setup for the type of hunting that we're doing. It's, it's tough to be, it's such a lightweight setup. I think it's the best lightweight lightweight setup out there. It's not a cheap rifle. It's not an inexpensive mm-hmm. investment, but the 65 RPM, we've tested it now. It's been devastating. It shoots nice and flat, it's fast. You'll see in all our films these animals are dropping, you know. We're hitting uh these bears, these deer. I mean, Ryan shoots that deer, that big trashy buck. Mm-hmm. Um, and this year in, in our, with that hunt we did with Paley, mm-hmm. you know, and you see that buck just, it's just out cold yep. instantaneously. Lights and got shut off. Of course, any bullet you put in the right spot in general with most calibers yeah. can do the job. But I mean, like all your bear hunts from last year, all those bears died within feet. They yeah. took a couple steps maybe and died or they just fell over right there on the spot. And for us, we're backpacking <clears throat> really deep. And Pounds remote. matter. And so weight is a big deal for us. That's why that rifle is sweet it's got a short shorter barrel as well so it's just a compact little setup but it shoots lights out good caliber for bears no question it's just crushing them and bears are soft bears are really soft Mm -hmm. if you and and i think too many people aim forward on bears we get caught up in that even i do it everyone they hug that shoulder get Get away from the the shoulder get away from the shoulder dissect that bear in half Mm -hmm. and just aim for the middle and if you, and maybe aim for the middle and slightly forward mm-hmm. a little, maybe, or just aim for the middle, especially when it bears a black blob, a little bit of a black blob, mm-hmm. just aim for the middle, get your head trained and your brain to shoot further back. Too many people lose bears by shooting too mm-hmm. far forward and their vitals are back. They're further back than a deer or an elk. They're not up there in those shoulders. And if you do hit shoulders, those bears can go. Mm-hmm. So... Adam Weatherby was with us on this hunt, on, on one of our bear hunts, and Adam puts down a beautiful, he takes a beautiful um, <clears throat> chocolate or reddish uh, black bear, and it's pretty red. It's a, it's a nice bear, and it's a mature boar, but he hits it in the shoulder, and he's got a three thirty eight that he shoots this thing with, hmm. uh, and man, he hits it in the shoulder, though. That thing goes. It just keeps going. He has to shoot it again you know, mm-hmm. to really put it down. But he did that mistake where he aimed a little too much into the shoulder. Cause most guys are used to deer and elk and stuff and hit the shoulders. <clears throat> Do to us, tactics. To us, you damage too much meat. We're not a big fan of mm-hmm. the shoulder because we want to preserve as much meat as possible. So we like to go in the soft spots, mm-hmm. but Ryan actually shoots a bear kind of, he shoots it middle pretty far back. Uh, every time we do that, they go down. Bears can't handle their guts being hit or their mm-hmm. or their stomach. They're not like a ungulate. They're not like a deer and elk. Mm-hmm. I swear, you hit them anywhere, liver, guts, stomach, like they just they die. <sighs> they just it lets the air out of them. Um, anywhere up in the chest cavity and the shoulders and all that, mm, you better hit them right because if you don't, they can go forever with <clears> one of so, those hits. So I guess. Um, the caliber, the six five RPM. Mm-hmm. You're a fan. Yeah, the scope we're running, and it's and the scope we're running. Uh, I've got a, a Leupold Mark V, I believe, on there, 
or Mark six. And, uh, I've run the three as well. And all of them are great. Pick one that's lightweight, sem- somewhat lightweight, but, um, yeah, I, it's just a, my little pole scope is built like a tank. It's clear. It's, I like a scope that I feel like I can drop out of an airplane and it'll <laughs> still shoot. And that's where Leopold really comes in. And some of their, their scopes are just indestructible, but they're built from a tactical perspective, you know, to take the hit from an IED and stuff. And Mm so Leopold's just don't fail. So, um, I love that scope. And then, um, we're running a by a Spartan precision bipod. And that's been a favorite Mm -hmm. piece of equipment. So let's actually move right. And I think you need to go to on the bipod. Ryan, uh, has like the pro that's adjustable one side more than the other can get pretty tall. That's the one you want. You want the newer pro, not the older one. So there was a question that I had. It's, it's great that you bring that up because it just segues right into that. I'm trying to find the gentleman, mm-hmm. but, um, basically he was asking bipods versus shooting sticks. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, he sees you guys using bipod so you obviously must really like that but he feels like shooting sticks might give him more versus more more options yeah okay so let's talk about that ryan and i like to shoot under 300 yards if possible we've we've uh, taken a few animals in that 380 to 400 range here and there ryan shot a chamois in new zealand at about 400 but in general we try to stay under three and if we can get closer 250 200 we do uh, we really feel like, you know, you just can't miss when you're close. Mm-hmm. There's You take all the mystery out. A lot of the problems, plus it makes cooler film because you're closer. Plus it makes a more fun hunt because you're trying to get closer without getting caught, without getting, you know, busted. And so there's some, there's some coolness to that that we like. Um, it's just our style. Now, the bipods... Um, we both like to be prone as much as possible when we're taking a shot. And he's right. You do have options where you can, with shooting sticks, where you have more options. But you don't have a, what's your backrest? What do you got holding up your the back of your rifle and giving you a stable platform? Mm-hmm. Now, I've seen some guys run like, like um, they'll use their tripod in the back, shooting sticks in the front, mm-hmm. you know, and they'll get that gun like sort of in a bench rest where the whole thing is supported that way. Triclops sells. Triclops? Yeah, and a couple <clears throat> others, they sell like a turret in the front to for one tripod to hold the front and one mm. to hold the back. And then mm. you can just kind of zero it in. And again, it's like a bench rest. It, there's a back rest for the butt of the rifle. Mm. Interesting. That's why laying down prone works so well, because there's a rest for the back of the rifle as mm-hmm. well as the front of the rifle. Um, and so, but... I think, man, it's tough to make a great shot, especially at range. Um, it's it's so much easier if you're prone. Um, it, but if you do run some kind of shooting stick or whatever, you kind of need something in the back, or you need to be close to pretty close, sub one hundred, sub one fifty, two hundred. I've I've shot uh, a buck, a couple of bucks at around two fifty, just with with a bipod on the front and just balancing it in the back. Uh, but I kind of used my knees as the backrest uh, from a seated position with my elbows up on my knees and felt pretty steady and slowly squeezed. But I don't, we're both fans of the bipod because the bipod, especially ones that have longer legs, because sometimes we're hunting steep country. And when you get prone, you need, you need some longer leg bipods to get that rifle up. You know what I mean? Because you're shooting off a steep hill and you're, you know, you kind of need that rifle up a little bit to make those angles. And uh, that's where the Spartan Precision one works well. I have a Harris bipod that's lightweight that I really like, but it's still way heavier than the Spartan Precision. It's like Mm -hmm. twice as heavy in ounces count. So not a big fan of shooting sticks myself. I I like bipods and I like that removable lightweight one by Spartan precision. So I like the bipod by, um, Harris Mm -hmm. quite a bit, but isn't it like two pounds? Uh, I don't think it's that heavy, but it is, 
it is always on your rifle. It doesn't come off. Mm-hmm. Like the other one just pops off, slides in your pack or whatever. And so you can zip your rifle real tight to your, mm-hmm. to your pack. pack and, um, b- but the bipod on the, when you mount a bipod on the front, if I was shooting more than 400 yards, I might go with a Harris bipod or some other higher tech bipod that actually puts uh that actually has a spring in it and really locks the, the rifle into place. It's kind of spring loaded and then there's more tension there. And then it just makes for a better. When I went to sniper class with the Leupold crew, the sniper guy was like, you got to run a Harris bipod or mm-hmm. something similar. If you're really going to shoot those longer Far shots. Range. Now I'm no long range shooter or real big rifle guy. Mm-hmm. You know, we're more about getting close and executing good stocks and making good shots. And so for us, the lightweight rifle with a quality scope that can get banged around, just slung on your pack and dropped on a mountainside like all the mm-hmm. time is key with a bipod that's super lightweight as well. And for a backrest, I got to tell you, what what we've been using is Lampers has, and I have these butt pads that we sit down and glass on. Mm-hmm. And when the ground's cold or wet or whatever, we you'll see those pads like strapped on our backpacks. We use those pads to sit on constantly. We unbuckle them, sit on them. But we also use them when we're taking that shot, because if you take one of those pads and you fold it in half and you slide it underneath the rifle, it's got this perfect tension and you can just press on the pad a little bit and it'll drop the butt of the rifle or let it come back up. It gives you a really stable shooting platform. It's pretty impressive. So between the, the Spartan precision bipod on the front, that's really lightweight and that butt pad curled in the back, which we carry anyway, Mm. we have a really, adjustable and quick shooting platform that's really stable and we smoked our bears this year right on next question multiple people ask this question i kid you not like a dozen people from your last gear podcast asked the same question so Mm -hmm. i just picked the one the zekman family brian where can i find that bottle holder by the way those boot fans are a great idea thanks for sharing okay the just the bottle holder just the, everyone wanted to know about the belt the bo- loop bottle holder yeah everyone wanted to know what was the brand what was the make where did you get it okay that's initial ascent they make oh, that is? bottle holder it's perfect it holds my gsi micro light it also holds the nalgene perfectly i love it um i've used others made by other brands uh but this one it's a perfect fit it's deep i don't need some of them have a buckle or a strap my bottle never falls out but it, it, it's got quite a bit of adjustability and it'll fit on multiple belts depending on your backpack that you're running. But it was initial ascent. <clears throat> um, okay. And the, and the boot dryers he mentions, those are by Graxaw. And use the code Gritty and you'll save over there. Use the code Gritty at initial ascent too if you're going to get a pack, if you're going to get the bottle holder, mm-hmm. all of that. Any use, other accessory, use code Gritty. Use the code Gritty. But, the, um, but yeah, the Graxaw boot warmers – their money. Check those out at graxaw.com. There's links to all this stuff in our YouTube videos mm-hmm. down below. Next question is from William Elder. And also a lot of people. So his is a two part question, mm-hmm. but his first part, a lot of people ask this. What is that scope and barrel cover that you guys are using? Where did you get it? How do you like it? All right. That's a stealthy hunter rifle cover. Mm-hmm. Um, you can pick them up from stealthy mm-hmm. from, uh, that's oh, ST it? Healthy. Yeah, ST Healthy. And there's a link in our YouTube mm-hmm. video in the description down below. So you can pick those up there. Dude, they're the <clears throat> they're the coolest deal. It's a padded scope cover. It mm-hmm. also covers the action on your rifle, all that stuff. And then it's got the, the cover over the barrel so you don't get dirt down it. My wife says it covers up the naughty bits. Yeah. Bare minimum. It's like a, it's like a and, swimsuit. And it's got a little handle. And you'll see a stock mm-hmm. like... We'll be moving our, like through, and we'll got the little handle on the top. Mm-hmm. Hold, we'll, we'll be carrying it by the handle. Um, man, it's it's a pretty legit cover, and and unlike a lot of rifle covers, this actually protects it. So it's got some foam around it, and so when the scope gets banged or knocked or the rifle, it's got a little protectiveness around all that mm-hmm. stuff. So Ryan uh, has been selling them for about a year and a half or so. Mm-hmm. Stealthy Hunter. They got a couple and, new colors in too. They got black mm-hmm. and um, 
what was it a green one yeah and, and you can there's a couple of retail places that have picked them up now oh nice too so but ryan i think he's got plenty in stock and just use the code uh use the link below in our description field and Sweet. pick yourself up a rifle cover over there the second half of uh, mr elder's question is is uh how do you not get diarrhea eating all that sodium from those ramen noodles thanks Okay, so um, the ramen noodles that I've got, first of all, they're lotus noodles. They're the lotus uh, rice noodles. Rice noodles. Right. Yeah. So they're, they're quality noodle made from rice. They're pick not them up at really Costco, gluten. Right? You pick them up at Costco or any of the health food stores like Whole Foods or Harmons and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's a quality noodle. And then the, the uh, broth that we're running is actually Lono Life. Mm-hmm. bone broth and lono life bone bone broth is actually like a super clean bone broth it doesn't have this sodium in it that he's talking about we're not really running top ramen whatever but um i also don't get diarrhea from too much sodium that's never happened to me i i'm like a salt i need lots of salt some people don't some people struggle if they have too much salt it seems like i cannot get enough um I I sweat a lot, so I I just can replenish, have a lot of salt. But the Lono Life bone broth mixed with those lotus noodles is money. And then we typically bring like pink Him- Himalayan uh, sea salt or pink Himalayan salt of of different kinds. And uh, I actually bring salt. Ryan brings salt. I had to borrow a lot of salt from Ryan here and mm-hmm. there, a few pinches on this trip because I forgot my salt. That's dangerous. But, we actually add more salt to our Lono mm-hmm. Life um, and to our bone broths and stuff like that. We actually increase our, our how much salt by putting a little pinch in there. Might put a little pinch in some hot chocolate, put a little pinch in different things. I actually like having just a little bit of salt. Ryan had some um, like fancy salts in bags, a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Like uh, some were mixed with a little garlic, some were mixed with like chocolate and. Mm-hmm. A few different, mm. like, mesquite wood chips Fancy. or something. And so he's just opening up little salts, and he's putting them in different things and <laughs> adding a little bit to them. But, but um, yeah, not really crushing the Mountain House uh, over-sodium-type mm-hmm. meals, not really taking on normal top ramen and the sodium in those packets. So no, I'm not looking really up dealing that, that. regular sodium or regular top ramen. It's about 850 to 900, depending on the flavor that you're picking. Mm-hmm. And with your uh, Lona Life, it's about 500 to 550, yeah. depending on the flavor again. So about a 300 milligrams difference of sodium. About a third, it looks like, mm-hmm. less yep. sodium. It seems to be the proper amount of sodium. Again, I don't know that it's necessarily the, the sodium. It's the qual- It's the type of sodium, the quality yeah, of true. it probably, and also how unclean the rest of the ingredients are that might be causing digestive mm-hmm. problems. It could be the noodles that being that typical ramen noodles are like worse than a <laughs> Wonder Bread or a donut. Yeah, you know, so it could be different things. It's like like, it's like uranium at that point. It's not great for who knows. You. But yeah, um, another one. So uh, I just picked this one from Mister Ken. A lot of people ask this question. It's about socks. Mm-hmm. Great podcast. Watched it multiple times. As for socks, I've got I've gone down the rabbit hole a bit. Had darn tough socks, smart rules. The one I prefer are Fox Rivers, Fox River, over the calf military type style. Um, he was trying out the merino version. Um, have you tried the Fox River socks? They make merino blends and a few that have copper infused fabric. Uh, no, I haven't. Back in the day, I had the sock liners, the like the Fox River sock liners. Mm-hmm. But uh, I haven't used that sock. Mm-mm. Have you used any copper infused anything? No, I haven't. Uh, silver, some of the silver mm-hmm. infused to deal with sweat and it kills bacteria. Mm-hmm. Um, Sitka had some silver lined garments that help um, kill bacteria, keep the odor, you know, less pungent on a two, three week long hunt with the same garment on mm-hmm. that's synthetic. But. Mm. No, I haven't done that. I for me, I kind of found a system and I've stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I truly love the smart wool sock liners. 
I'll have to check out some of the Fox River stuff. Mm -hmm. Smart Wool came out with newer versions over the last couple of years. They're not making them like they used to. Mm -hmm. They're not as good. They're falling apart. The same design, same sock liner is not the same as it was years ago. Being made overseas. Whatever. Just being changed. You know, Mm -hmm. it looks the same, but it ain't the same. That's a bummer. That sometimes happens. Uh, But still, they're working for me. The smart wool. But you need a really thin wool liner. Uh, A synthetic doesn't work for me day after day after day. I can wear a really thin wool liner and then wear like a darn tough over that. And my feet are going to, are going to kind of, I'm not going to get blisters or sore spots or anything. Now the, the other trick though, is having a boot that's cool enough. If you're going to be sweaty and hot and really hiking a lot of miles, having a cool, a boot that has a lot of airflow and lets a lot of air come in because blisters and sore feet are caused by heat and moisture. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, it's hard to get away from. If you have a hot boot on. I just attract heat and moisture, both my sheer personality and body. It just happens. And I yeah, get away there's, from that. There's heat and moisture in that boot and blisters form. Uh, raw spots, hot spots form. So I did run the Laponia this seat, this time on this last hunt. Mm-hmm. My crispy Laponia because it was pretty hot. And I wanted a cooler boot on and I'd sprained my ankle and they don't have any ankle support, but I was wearing an ankle brace anyway. So it didn't quite matter because I had braces on. Mm -hmm. So I actually preferred that. I actually preferred the system of running my ankle braces and then wearing the crispy Laponia on top. Mm -hmm. And uh, they breathe better. They're, they're, they're more comfortable. They have a lower profile sole. So Mm -hmm. you don't feel like you're going to roll or twist your ankle at all. They're lighter weight. You're not picking up as much weight every day as you're hiking. Isn't it? That's what. But they're comfy though. Mm -hmm. They they're supportive still. The only issue for me has always been that they don't quite have the ankle support. Mm -hmm. And in later season, they're cold. Like I need something warmer. Mm -hmm. Um. So my I've always said that I really love that crispy Nevada uninsulated boot, and I still love that and the insulated version, and I love the Wild Rock for late season. But man, this summertime spring, I think I'm going Laponia and maybe even early September, I'm going Laponia with ankle braces moving forward. And I'll talk Mm. more about that setup, but it was money. I had far less problems with my feet getting hot wearing that Laponia. Now, when the snow came and it got a little cold, my feet were a little cold, but it wasn't, it was manageable. And I'd take the couple of cold days I had you know, in the mornings with my feet being a little cold, I'd, I'd take that over having to wear a boot that's hot mm-hmm. that I rarely need it to be warm for. I mean, I didn't need it except for a few hours, a couple of mornings to be a little warmer boot. No big deal. I just rolled with it. But on those 85 degree days when we were hiking and carrying like Ryan's giant bear off the mountain in my pack, down, going down straight, steep slopes, having all of that airflow because it's got like a neoprene tongue. So air is just coming through that boot and it's a light, thin boot. Um, but I still had all that support with the ankle brace and the shape of the boot. I'm, I just really loved it. I, I love the Laponia from day one, but I kind of dismissed it because it didn't have the ankle support built in. But with an ankle brace, and I use that Sweeto Universal ankle brace, S-W-E-D-O, Universal, I believe what it called, I've used that since high school. I've never sprained my ankle with one of those braces on. Are those those big, chunky, white ones that look really ugly? Yeah. They make them black, <laughs> though, too. But they're not big and chunky. Mm-hmm. They're just a typical brace, but they they are so supportive. They're the best ankle brace uh, on the market, in my opinion. The most supportive. I've never sprained my ankle playing basketball in leagues in three, four days a week. And only time I've hurt myself is when I don't have one on. And I do something. Uh, but in the Nevadas, I was able to wear those for years and not sprain them. But Ryan and I were chasing down a hill and I had just taken my boots off and I threw them on real loose and I tight, I didn't tighten them. I just threw them on loose because we were glassing and, and I had just cooled my feet off. Well, we, we ran after this bear and I should have taken a moment to stop and lace up my boots tight, but I didn't. I left them like 
just kind of super loose. I stepped on a rock and twisted my ankle. I mean, it was just weird. And now I've been struggling with a, like a, it feels like a ligament might've popped a little bit. So Mm -hmm. now I'm back to an ankle brace and the Laponia. I can run through the mountains in tennies and Mm -hmm. I'm fine. But once I load heavy load on my back and I'm taking these side hills that are super steep and my ankle wants to roll Mm -hmm. to the outside, I can't, it's hard. So the ankle brace is money. Any other guys that have problems uh, with their ankles, that Sweeto Universal Brace in the Laponia might be the ticket. It might be better than a boot that supposedly mm-hmm. is built to support your ankle. Honestly. It's going to be a lot lighter. I'm going to test it a whole bunch more. I'm excited to see how it goes. But that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. All right. Next question is from Cy Sneed. Awesome video and info on the critters on Kodiak. I remember you talking about your time on Japan on one hunt. I think he doesn't realize that you were just kind of living there, that you weren't hunting there. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations for an outdoorsman to see slash do in Japan? I know, I know you didn't get to hunt, but like, what are some things that I guess in Japan that you must see that are outdoors type stuff? I would suppose. I don't know what exactly kind of hunting there is available in Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, They eat anything. I was going to say, they've got to I mean, they, hunt. They, they eat everything. Uh, but mostly it's sea creatures. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of it is fish and seafood and Bow crustaceans. Fish is huge over and, there. And they're eating a lot of sea creatures. Um, they're harvesting mussels and clams and things on the beach. And they're going down to the ocean for... So there's a lot of that kind of hunting for seafood and scavenging for, for that. But... There were deer on the island. I never did see people hunt them, though. Mm-hmm. They're like a smaller, weird, d- kind of different deer. And they're only in some isolated pockets, as far as I know. There's monkeys, and they're meaner than hell. I was going to say, dude, they got to eat monkey. The monkeys kind of scared me and chased me one time off this mountain. I mean, I sort of antagonized them, because you're curious. I was going to say, you, you and, got uh, too close. the whole pack, whatever, came descending on me, and they scared me. I ran, uh, got on my bike. But all these monkeys are flooding after <laughs> you in the trees, like 30 of them. It's like, ah, um, they're used to people and they're not going to take any crap, yeah, you know? Yeah. So they ain't scared. Um, it's mountainous, but I don't, I don't really know. Um, if I, I well, one thing that blew my mind about Japan is they actually, I mean, the, allegedly, as far as I know, this is a true story. They have brown bears on in, in Japan, like, Full on like Russian Kamchatka, Kodiak Island, really? giant man eating brown bears. And um, maybe do a little Google. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. But Green Tree was showing me pi- pictures of a dude that was like eaten by a bear in Japan. And uh, they actually do hunts there um, in Japan, you know, um, hunting brown bear or. or like a grizz. Um, I know there are, it says there's black bears. In Japan? Usuri brown bear is found. Mm-hmm. Shantar Island. Mm-hmm. And they've eaten people. Hokkaido? Hokkaido. Hokkaido and Kunoshiri. I mean, it's right off of Hokkaido's all the way north. Yeah. 12 feet of snow in the winter the very, time. very, very tip of it. Gnarly, you know, mm-hmm. reaches. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know how a bear got there. Or... It looks like they jumped it from... So Russia? Like, from like... Uh... So, it shows them in some places in Russia, uh-huh. China, the Shantar Islands. Of Japan. I can't tell. I don't think so. Because it mentions a bunch of other ones. Then Korea, then China, and then it lists the Japan, uh, Hokkaido, and Kunishiro. Kunishiri. Yeah, Hokkaido. Hokkaido, yeah. But that's listed at the very end of it. Um, because it but it mentions China and the Korean Peninsula. Like, it sounds like they're kind of... But it says they're they're going from... They're swimming to a lot of these islands and right. chaining their way out there. Right. As far as I know, these brown bears are living in Hokkaido or northern Japan. And they Yizo, actually... Yizo brown bear in Hokkaido. It sounds like they have eaten people. And then they've come, brought people in to hunt them. Um, 
Um, and they're exceptionally dangerous in Japan, more dangerous than in other places. They have, um, there's a, there was a brown bear in 1915. We've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. Um, in San Kebetsu district, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, a brown bear walked in and just said, mm, I'm going to kill seven people. <laughs> just walked into town, killed seven people, injured three others. And so they made a shrine for the bear. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Japan. What people, a lot of people don't realize is like eighty percent of Japan is mountainous. Mm-hmm. Only twenty percent is is valleys and low spots where homes and stuff are built. So much of Japan is rugged mountain regions that are untouched. So I could see sheep and goat species and bears and some animals that live up in those upper regions of the mountains really thriving because they're so they don't like who can get there you know, up in those places because... And then who's going to live with the brown bears? Yeah, almost Heck <laughs> no. I'm looking at these things and I'm thinking like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Dude, Adam Greentree showed me some... This was years ago. He he, he had a, like a, a whole like article that he was showing me from within his phone that was showing these man-eating brown bears in, in Japan and that he actually had been invited to go hunt there. And he went... I think he went and he hunted there trying to find one. Um. But didn't didn't kill one. I would um, drop everything to go hunt brown bears in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a thing. Can you, can you think of something more magical? I mean, uh, it's, I, apparently, it's a thing. I didn't. It's a thing. I didn't go into deep research on it after that. But yeah, um, so maybe this gentleman can go chase um, man eating brown bear in northern Japan. Uh, mm. But otherwise, I don't know, man. Um. I haven't even looked into it, but fishing and all that kind of stuff, you can go and do that. That's all over. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an island yeah. in the ocean. so <laughs> And it's a long island. It's got a lot of coast. They don't seem to have any Asian cultures in general. Don't seem to have, um, um, unless they're, you know, Hindu or something. Most, most of them are perfectly, there's no sentimental attachment to protein, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if it's if it's a monkey, mm-hmm. if it's a cat, if it's a dog, fish it's, and dogs it's, have like, the same soul. They all have the same soul, and they're yeah. all like fine to eat. Like yeah. if if they provide nutrient, they're not. They don't have these sentimental attachments that we do, mm-hmm. where we're like, oh, but that's that's a dog. You can't eat that. No, that doesn't. <laughs> that's like what? No, what? It's protein. Huh? Like it why walks, does it? Why it barks? <laughs> it's food, <laughs> right? Like there's a much. It's different more logical approach to uh, animals as far as a food source. Okay. Um, do you want to do a couple more? Yeah, do, do, do like two more. Let's do this one right here from Bryant Payne Woods, a.k.a. the Swaggy Bowman. No, oh, he's on Locals. Mm-hmm. He's in our gritty, stealthy community. Mm-hmm. He says, hey, this is Swaggy Bowman. You should try the Kuyu Tiburon Pants. They are Kuyu's version of the Sitka Ascent Pants, and they are a lot quieter than the Ascent Pants. Also, try the Tiburon shirt. I hope I'm saying that right. Tiburon? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's great, too. Best warm weather gear system by Kuyu. So I totally love those pants. I used mm-hmm. them when they first came out, like pre-20, I don't remember what it was, 2014 they came out or something, 2013. Mm-hmm. I was rocking those pants way back in the day. You feel naked in them. That's why I like them. It's like mm-hmm. a pair of pajamas. Um, they aren't real durable, though. I mean, they're like it's like a pant with micro holes in them. They're way more comfortable. Well, not way more comfortable because the ascents are also comfortable. But I would give the durability to the ascent pant, hands down, over the Tiburon. But the comfort to the Tiburon. Tiburon was my favorite pants for hunting in... September and or any hot weather. I mean, they're just a dream come true. Uh, so I'm more, I'm right there with with him with Swaggy. I'm all <laughs> about I'm all about the Tiburon. Now, that's a good segue into talking about the Kuyu gear. I did try. Mm-hmm. I, ra- I ran the Katana or ka- Katuna, Kutu- Kutu- whatever Kutu- those pants are. Yeah. Uh, the, the Kuyu. I should know the name. Tuna. Are they the Katana? I don't know if it's. I don't think it's Katana. Um, they're a Japanese name. Uh, Kuyu, uh, pant. I'm terrible. Katana series. I'm terrible about all these names. Like, um, it's Katana. Yeah, Kutana. 
Katana. Not Katana. 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 So uh, ideal for early to mid-season and hunts and rugged conditions. Uh, stretch woven pant. Like, so that one of the best all-around pants I've ever worn in my life. They were legit. They are cut perfectly for my big booty and my big thighs and hammies. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I like about them, because Mark Livesey was there and he's wearing Piranha Zions. And I love Piranha as well. Mm -hmm. I wear those. I'm wearing them now. Like I wear those for streetwear at home all the time at shows. But when you wear uh, Piranhas up in the mountains and stuff, they're, they're a nice weight pant and they breathe really well. But the leg doesn't taper at all, so they it, they do get caught on mm -hmm. stubs and stobs coming off as trees as you're going through deadfall or whatever. And then Mark and I were joking. They also grow a size or two bigger <laughs> <laughs> after a week of wearing them. Yeah. And so your piranhas sort of stretch, 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 and they don't shrink back to a nice fit until you've washed them and put them through the dryer, mm -hmm. and then they kind of... So it can be a real problem as you wear your piranha day after day. They have the little built-in cinch for a belt right there, in in the in and you pull that thing, and pretty soon that tail starts, it's three inches at first, and then it's six, and then it's like twelve, and it <laughs> your pants just get mm -hmm. they just stretch and stretch and stretch, um, and it just seems like you're always uh, they don't hold their shape. Now the Kuyu Katana that I ran legit they. They stayed, I, I weren't literally wore them like three weeks straight without washing or doing anything with them. They, they shed, they, they handle, they don't stretch. They stay, they stretch just right, but they don't get too big. They like, they hit a, a size and they just stay there. Even my Sika pants would sort of continue to get baggier and baggier, especially I did like the apex, the Sika apex pants, but you rip like five holes in them. I had a hole in the crotch. I got caught on a stick last year and then it was just a, a hole for ticks to crawl into all day long mm. and i was trying to duct tape it and sew it and keep but the hole was giant that's the problem with merino is it tears real easily mm -hmm. but it is really comfortable and 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 nice and it doesn't start to stink so bad but these pants they didn't smell i mean they did but not like you mm -hmm. would expect they didn't stretch out of place they didn't get any holes they took a beating and they're still rocking and they felt great all the way up into day one. The sweat, they dried so fast. I got wet crossing creeks. I got wet from sweat. They dry like record time. And I had heard people talking about, I think Kuyu has just done a great job with their pants in general. I mm -hmm. I, I just he keep hearing great stuff. Now, my one of my other favorite pants is the Sitka Timberline pant with the knee pads built in, mm -hmm. reinforced knees and butt. And for later season, it's a great pant. It feels really good. It's a nice one. I'll have to dive into this the Kuyu lineup to see what compares to that. Um, but I suspect they have they just have the cut down mm -hmm. too at Kuyu. It, they have the cut. Um, so I'm impressed with that. The other thing I ran was the Kuyu various down. So I had a Kuyu down vest, a Kuyu down lighter top, and jacket and an, and then a heavy like the pro down the big old down i love them they're i love them they're like they like poof, shrink to nothing like you just stuff them in little tiny holes and crevices you can put them in your water bottle pocket you put like two jackets in that pocket you put them in, it's like it's like they just shrink into nothing they weigh nothing they're it's trippy it's trippy i really like that my my sitka stuff um is durable highly durable i'd say sitka has a little bit of the edge and durability on on kuyu probably i can't really say for sure but i'm not sure it outweighs the performance i'm not sure it's worth the durability in trade for the performance you get because that kuyu weighs nothing it's featherweight but i was totally warm super comfy in the stuff it was a little bit louder but for rifle hunting it doesn't really matter when i'm putting on a puffy and all that and you're sneaking in you know um, and then what I would run is I have that Kuyu, uh, hoodie, so I could run that with the vest and it was plenty quiet cause my arms aren't really moving and the vest is a little quieter. But I think also the more I use that vest and the jackets that they were brand new. So they kind of made a little more noise. Uh, Ryan's puffy that he runs from stone glacier 
it also was a little bit noisy at first. It's a little quieter now that he's used it for quite a while. I think the same could be true. I'm not sure. But so far, the Kuyu stuff I ran, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I really dig it. I think it's for the type of hunting Ryan and I are doing, the lightweight, whatever, it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Ryan has a whole bunch of it at his house that he ran years ago as well. Both of us ran Kuyu way back when. Mm-hmm. Uh, and still, there are certain garments I have. I still have my Tiburon pants. They have a lot of holes in them mm-hmm. from the old days. And they got the zipper on the side. And um, But, yeah, I'm I'm a fan. Okay, last question is from Joshua Grosbeck. Mm-hmm. And this is from the uh, second uh, Kodiak Alaska Blacktail Hunt film. Uh huh. What was that closing hymn called? Um, was it? Was he talking about "We Ain't Even Kin"? I think that's what he's talking about. It's a Benjamin Todd song, I'm pretty sure. But it's "We Ain't Even Kin." Benjamin Todd, "We Ain't Even Kin." Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's funny that he called it a hymn, though. <laughs> well, it kind of, kind of is. Yeah. Um, I love Benjamin Todd. All his stuff. It's deep, mm-hmm. twangy, um, but, but uh, authentic. It's real. You you can't sing like that and sing those kinds of songs unless you've, I think, unless you've been through some stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of those artists that, you know, they struggle with inner demons, but that's why they are able to evoke and, and speak the truth through their music in a way that... And I can't write a song like that because I I haven't lived it. Mm-hmm. I don't it's not my life, my lived experience. I can't really do that. I, it's like someone writing about drug addiction and surviving it and what it's like and how to fight it and what they've gone through and how they feel and the emotions they felt. I haven't had drug addictions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's hard for me, but I can talk about hunting <laughs> in a way that I think people will relate to yeah. because down to my core and my soul, that's what I do. And I, I love, and I love animals and, so I think that's somewhat why the reason why some of the films I produce really connect with people. But that song is We Ain't Even Kin. And um, yeah, uh, it's got to be that song. Well, there were some others, actually, mm-hmm. that we ran. And those songs were by Camp, C-A-A-M-P. Camp is another uh, artist that we reference and use quite often whenever we can in our, in our films. And that one also is... Um, their songs are we've used often, and we've turned a lot of our audience on to camp. I think you get all their albums and rock them all the time. They're good. Same with Benjamin Todd. Check them both out. So what do you think, Brent? We good? Answer those questions? It was Benjamin Todd. We ain't even kidding. Cool. Just double checking. So, folks. Um, yeah. There's more questions. Yeah. Keep hitting us up on the on the YouTubes. Leave your questions there, comments. We try to get through those. For those who we've been going through the, uh, we're going to continue to do this. We're doing the same thing on the locals in our gritty, stealthy community page over at locals.com. If you want to become a member over there, you can join our platform. It's $7 a month. There's there's uh, bonus films over there and podcasts that are only, that are exclusive to people that are paying supporters. And over there, we're going to continue to drop some cool shows and episodes mm-hmm. that are just there, but we're also trying to create content where we directly engage with that, that community. And a lot of, a lot of posts are being made and questions being asked there. And we're kind of going through those things and summarizing them and, and publishing there. If you want to access that, it's just a little extra. If you really dig the show and you want to pay a little extra and support us and get bonus stuff, that's where to go. We share a little more there than we do on the other platforms um bonus stuff but we'll always be dropping as much as we can on the free stuff also we're going to probably kick up our parlor account now that it's back Mm -hmm. um and i think i'm going to delete my facebook account really i'm going to delete it i haven't checked it in five years Uh, i have my gritty facebook account but i never i never use it Uh, so i have my personal and my gritty i'm ready for it to be gone so i'll probably delete facebook i'll run parlor um, people want to follow us over there. That's cool. And, uh, I think I'll do Instagram still, but we're putting our emphasis a lot on our gritty, stealthy community, a lot of photos and a lot of posts and a lot of 
video content is going up over there in our exclusive community. You don't have to be a paying supporter to see a lot of the posts. You just have to if you want to leave a comment or make a post of your own. Mm -hmm. So you can still go over there and become a member and don't pay a dime, and you'll still see a lot of what's going on. I was going to say, dude. 80% 80% of people that are on social platforms are lurkers. They don't say or do nothing. <laughs> They're just watching. So you can still see that. And, and uh, there's links to all of that in the description fields of all of our YouTube videos. And um, yeah, check it out. We like locals because, first of all, we're getting supported directly from mm-hmm. the fans instead of through um, through a paying sponsor or partner. And so... That just gives us more room to be as independent as possible. Now, we work with partners, but we only run gear we really love. We only promote people and brands and companies we really dig. We could sell different game bags, but Austin's awesome, and he makes Mm -hmm. a great product, and nobody knows who his name is if we don't talk about it. Like, Mm -hmm. He's not in a mainstream space, but it's a killer product, and it's fun to work with smaller companies. Travis Nowotny, he's selling goat knives, and we're a partner with him. Um his knives are legit and use the code gritty. You save over there, but he's growing that company. I'd rather do that than Benchmade. I'd rather have the smaller dudes and we grow together than the big name companies that sponsor you. And, um, I like it. I like how that's going and maybe goat doesn't quite measure up, but it's also half the price, but a killer product. And that's good enough for me, but I wouldn't sell it or I wouldn't recommend it if it wasn't awesome, if it wasn't great Mm -hmm. for what we need it to do. So that's how we like to roll. Anyway, let's wrap it up, bro. We're going to hit you up again. We're going to try to keep a lot of content flowing over the next three or four weeks. We're recording extra shows every day and uh, we want to really, we've been gone for about a month. So it's time to, uh, it's time to set to produce more content for y'all. And we're working on films. We went over it today. I think we have I'd say we have nine. Be careful. Be careful. Let's not promise. <laughs> well, I'd say too we much. have eight. There we go. Eight killer mm-hmm. black bear hunting shows. And then um and then uh I'm heading off to if all goes well mm-hmm. to a grizzly bear hunt in Alaska in a, about a week or so. And, uh, if, and maybe we'll have film from that, whether I get a grizz or I don't, you know, a lot of times when you go up North, you may not even see a grizzly, even though you're out there for 10 days, it's just hard to find them. I mean, it, it's sparse country. And so we'll see how that goes, but I'd like to come back with footage from that too. So we maybe five part or a four part episode from that. That'd be cool. Um, but I, yeah, we got at least two months worth of great, great epic bear content and if the grizzly hunt goes where well we have another month mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm hoping to have three months of cool now the grizzly stuff is or the black bear stuff also has grizzly in it because yeah. <laughs> we had like six grizzly experiences or encounters or views and some quite close so and some caught on film so it's going to be cool for people to watch our uh, bear hunts, I think. I think they're going to really enjoy them. Um, but w- w- because I'm leaving, I think, next week for a little while, probably won't drop our films until, unfortunately, until June. But we hope to be like the last half of June, July, August, and into September. We hope to have every Sunday occupied with gritty film content and maybe some in between. So we're just working hard, trying to pump out useful, useful content entertaining content for everybody so anyway thanks for supporting us again use the code gritty check out the links below in our youtube videos if you're shopping for gear see if there's anything in there that you can uh, use that that also supports us thanks for tuning in and as always stay gritty